Say the line, Mark. One Piece's Alabasta arc is the best manga experience I've had in my entire life. Yeah! I'm serious. Like, I knew this was going to be good, and there's been plenty of tension and suspense building over the course of the last few arcs. Certainly enough to tickle my little Irish feet, but I didn't know it was going to be this good. Like, this is advanced good. And over the course of this video, I will try to communicate to you all just how the best the Alabasta arc was for me, someone entirely new to this series. Over the last three videos, I've covered the introduction to the Straw Hat crew, explored their past, and explained the circumstances that have been building. But today, it all comes to a bursting point in this arc. The culmination of over a hundred chapters of phenomenal storytelling, character writing, and world building. I'm totally not Mark, and these are my first impressions, my thoughts on, and review for the greatest arc One Piece has offered up to this point. This is the writing masterclass, the phenomenal Alabasta arc. One of the main differences between this and the other acts prior can be seen first and foremost in its length. It's a long one, sure, but first I want to impress upon you just how long this was and how stupid I was when reading it. The arc itself spans 62 chapters, which translates to about six and a half volumes of manga. This is by far the most I've ever had to read in a given week for a single video. And because I'm dumb, I left myself with only two days to read the manga before I needed to write this script. Needless to say, I did it, but my hands are still healing from the paper cuts. However, the point I'm trying to make is that this story is long and great. So in order for me to break down my impressions and to explain how I think this arc pulls off its greatness, I'm going to need to break this story down into chronological sections to make this even remotely possible for me to analyze and present to you. And so with this disclaimer out of the way, let's talk about the first section, the world and setup. In a nutshell, the story of the Alabasta arc covers the kingdom's rebellion against their king and how the Barrack Works, led by Crocodile, has influenced the politics in the region in order to achieve what he wants. It kicks things off as the Straw Hat crew we've been following for the last hundred or so chapters finally begin to near the kingdom. It's a fascinating tale of friendship, war, betrayal, and loyalty. But for me personally, this is the moment One Piece stopped being just a great manga and became, for me, a true epic I think everyone needs to experience for themselves in order to truly appreciate it. Through reading One Piece over the last month, I think I've discovered the secret to Oda's writing, how he always seems to catch me by surprise. He sets up way too many things for me to even attempt to keep track of in my mind. And that's not a complaint. If anything, that's precisely what makes his world feel so alive and chaotic all the time. Typically, when I'm reading a story, I can identify the main two or three points a writer is using to create a subversion later. But with Oda, he keeps throwing things at me to remember and to keep in mind that eventually I have to say to myself, all right, Oda, you win. Take me where you want to go, which is super fun for me. And the means with which this arc opens is really interesting as it provides intrigue and suspense for us, the audience, without any conflict right away. Kicking things off, we get a scene where in Mr. Two, one of the main Baroque Works agents working for Crocodile gets picked up by Luffy and the gang. At this point in the story, they're suspected to be dead. And at this point, Mr. Two is a complete unknown to them too, which is a fantastic example of dramatic irony, which means that we, the audience, know more than the characters do right now. In this case, we know that Luffy and the gang want to avoid this guy, and we know that Mr. Two would want to apprehend this crew too had he known about them. And so watching as they make friends is both funny and nerve-wracking, as in the last arc, Sanji managed to get the Straw Hat crew the element of surprise in the first place. But during this interaction with Mr. Two, as a party trick, he reveals his devil fruit powers to transform into anyone he touches. However, once he leaves, it quickly becomes apparent to the crew just how lucky they really were, learning about Mr. Two's identity. And so in an attempt to stay one step ahead of him, the gang elect to tie a piece of cloth onto their left arms to identify themselves to each other if he ever becomes a problem in the future. Now, you see what I mean? They haven't even arrived at Alabasta yet, and we already have so many things to keep track of. And this story doesn't slow down either, as once we do touch down, we are introduced to Captain Smoker, who's already there looking for Luffy, and we are introduced for the first time to this ace character from the end of the last arc. <laughs> He is an entire kettle of fish into and of himself, so I'll try to cover what I thought about him succinctly. We learn that his real name is Portgas D. Ace, and that he's Luffy's brother, which raises all sorts of questions for me, like, are there no surnames in this world? 
what's the connection between him, Luffy, and Gold D. Roger? Maybe he's his father, but I feel like that's maybe too obvious. We also learn that Ace has a devil fruit power that pretty much makes him the human torch, which makes him objectively the coolest character now in the entire series. Essentially, his character is here to offer Luffy a spot with the pirate crew he's a part of, Whitebeard's pirates, and to give Luffy this piece of paper with nothing on it. See what I mean about this arc giving us so many things to remember and think about? Like Ace mentioned in the last arc that he was looking for Blackbeard. Then when he realized that he was long gone, he decided to look for Luffy. Like, is time travel involved in this? I have too many things to consider with this character. I know at this point that I'm trying to remember everything, which is a fool's errand, as I have at this point no way of telling which piece of information is pertinent to this story or what will be pertinent later. And so for the first time in the series so far, I have to relinquish control of my brain to Oda. One Piece, you have beaten me. But back to the story. The heart of the arc itself comes in the form of Princess Vivi's devotion to her kingdom, its people, and the desire she has to stop this senseless fighting. And once these opening pleasantries are taken care of, three separate storylines are set in motion in three different areas of Alabasta, which Oda uses as an excuse to teach us the geography of the country. And by the time we're finished with this arc, you will have a full comprehensive understanding of where everything is in this country. The number one priority on Vivi's list at this point is to prevent the rebellion, and so she elects that the best course of action is to not flee to the palace, but instead to try and reason with the rebel leader in an oasis called Yuba across a vast desert. This is great fundamentally as we needed a concrete goal to aim for as an audience, but it also sheds more light on Vivi's character. She's smart, but she's also incredibly brave and determined. And so just before the crew begin making their way to Yuba, Vivi sends Karu, her duck monster thing, on a long journey across another desert to relay a message to her father directly at the palace. The contents being proof of crocodile Crocodile's true identity using information she and Ingram gathered during their time undercover as Mr. Aid and Miss Wednesday. Once again, this is another example of the seeds Oda planted like 50 chapters ago now bears fruit for the story in making it that much more rich. And finally, to give context as to why Mr. Two had been traveling back to Alabasta, it appears that all the high-ranking individuals among the criminal syndicate known as the Baroque Works had been told to gather for the first time to meet the leader known to them as Mr. Zero, which they learn obviously to be Crocodile himself. This is initially shocking as Crocodile has been portrayed thus far in the series as an heroic figure in the area of Alabasta seen as a savior to the country. And with the reveal of this plan, we learn a great deal about Crocodile as a character. He's charismatic, confident, does not accept failure, and is incredibly manipulative. He reveals that he's not interested in money or status, but instead military might, revealing that he can obtain something that will give him absolute power once he gains access to it. It. And with that, each high-ranking member of the Barrack Works is given a specific mission. They are told that once their missions are all complete, the kingdom will explode. Ending the meeting by saying that his utopia starts tomorrow at 7 in the morning. This scene is great, but as I said, there's tons of characterization here for Crocodile in this section. Croc naturally at this point is aware that the Straw Hat crew is alive and more than likely in Alabasta right now with the princess. This naturally comes as a big surprise to Mr. Two. And so with that information, they all become aware that their secondary mission now is to prevent Princess Vivi from meeting with the rebel forces, as they have a vested interest in making this rebellion happen. And all of this information is really compelling and all the rest of it, but the scene itself becomes all the more better when Mr. Three reveals himself from the shadows, offering his services once again. However, in a demonstration of his ruthlessness and power, Croc sucks the moisture from Mr. Three's body before throwing him into a massive banana crocodile pit. It's a horrific scene, but a fantastic one that really, really sells us on Crocodile's character. And the progression of these three plot threads, watching them develop, complicate, and intertwine left me sincerely with my jaw on the floor as I watched Oda juggle and keep track of so many different moving parts at once. I like to pretend that he was spending sleepless nights constructing this with cork boards and connecting string all over his office, because this arc is nuts. And one storytelling mechanic Oda loves to use ad nauseum is that of the flashback, and I don't say that in a disparaging way either. Oda's goal is to make this world feel real and lived in, and in order for that to be the case, there needs to be history. And in a similar fashion as the rest of the series, this arc is the recipient of its very own flashback sequences. The first concerning the childhood of Princess Vivi and how she came to befriend the now leader of the rebel forces in an individual called Koza and his father Toto. It's enlightening, it's heartwarming watching as Koda saves her life, and it more importantly gives us a 
glimpse at the king's personality and nature. Admittedly, I thought he looked a little too much like Fire Lord Ozai from The Last Airbender not to be the most evil man in the series, but it turns out he's a super ridiculously kind and wise man, making his framing at the hands of Crocodile all the more infuriating and sad, elevating the character of Croc once again in our eyes as someone who needs to be dealt with soon. And as it happens in the world of One Piece, there are mechanisms with which to control and manipulate the weather. And that's essentially what the rebels led by Koza are looking to overthrow the king for, thinking that he's causing this drought or abstaining from calling upon more rain for the kingdom due to him being unkind or something. Which, as we discover thanks to flashback, is most definitely not the case. But what makes this Koza character as interesting as he is comes in the form of his father, who the gang encounter once they reach the now almost entirely deserted oasis of Yuba, where Koza is a radical rebel for justice looking to overthrow what he believes to be an evil cold king. Toto, his father, is an incredibly loyal, kind, and hard-working man, still keeping his faith in the king, trying to do his best in keeping the promise he made to him in building a town in Yuba. And in meeting this lovely but now starving, overworked old man, I get another glimpse at what makes this story of One Piece so special to me. Despite the tale being grand in scope, ambitious in its telling, and masterful in its execution, Oda always seems to find time to create pockets of story that are beautifully intimate between one or two characters. The one I'm referring to in this instance is Luffy's helping of the old man dig for water, trying to keep the oasis alive long into the night. It offers a window into the humble, kind old man's life, but it's also a small shared moment that reminds me why I love Luffy and the writing of this series. Luffy, who had been notorious for wasting food and water throughout this story, now treats this water Yuba's water with respect and care because he knows how much this means to the old man, he knows where it came from, and he knows what it represents, which is hope for the future of this country. It's a wonderfully intimate and subtle metaphor that encapsulates this entire story in the most precious of ways that sincerely brought a tear to my eye. And what's most impressive about this is, we haven't even really started yet. The suspense. The more time we spend in the massive area of Alabasta, the more it reveals to us its customs, cultures, geographical formations, and wildlife, which all play important roles in not only creating funny moments to help with the pacing, but their inclusions and mentionings also facilitate callbacks and surprises later in the story to push the plot forward. For instance, the clothing keeps the gang from overheating in the desert. Vivi, however, doesn't mind the heat at all as this is her home. The massive deserts that cover the country act also as obstacles that Oda uses to great effect. This isn't like any other story where we can just cut and the gang is suddenly where they want to be. Oh no. If there's a river, they have to provide a means with which to cross it. If there's a desert, they have to make sure that they have supplies. And as I'm sure you're starting to appreciate right now, this makes the story feel all the more impressive and detailed to me. And not to mention adds to the suspense of the occasion, which isn't helped as once they arrive and finish helping the old man in Yuba, they all immediately realize that not only are the rebels not where they thought they were, but they are also getting ready to march on the palace tomorrow. The same day the Utopia plan is happening with Croc, which the gang don't know about yet but we do. See how this dramatic irony is slipping into the story to create even more tension for us, the reader specifically. And so instead of journeying all the way back to the rebels at the beginning, Luffy decides that attacking the source of the trouble and pain is the best course of action. And after a particularly heated scene between Luffy and Vivi, it's decided that Croc is going down. He's their new target. And this is where things really start to pick up and get interesting for me. And let me tell you, it doesn't slow down from this point onwards at all. In response to learning Croc's true motives via Vivi's message, the king orders his military leaders to gather his forces and march on rain base, where Croc is stationed. And what's great about this scene is that it gives the king another chance to endear himself to us. For despite knowing that the rebels are going to be here soon, he still instructs his defenses to leave the palace where he is and attack the real source of danger. He wants only to protect his people. He doesn't care about his palace. And what's more is this also builds more tension as the Straw Hats arrive in Croc's town, which leads nicely into one of my favorite sequences in the arc. As once they arrive in the town, Oda introduces a nice little game of cat and mouse between Smoker, his subordinate, and the Straw Hat crew. Essentially, they end up getting separated, but in the end, plan on reconvening back at the casino where Croc's hideout is. However, this doesn't go to plan, and due largely to Luffy's lack of preparation and respect for how powerful Croc really is, most of the Straw Hats and Smoker himself get captured by Croc and miss all Sunday in a cage within the base. Now, I call this particular section of the story the suspense, as this is the section where, essentially, all the plans for the forces of good fly 
fly out the window in a fiery failure, the likes of which really made me stress out while I was reading. Essentially, the gang gets captured, Vivi's friend and loyal military commander arrives to save her but gets taken out by Miss All Sunday, Vivi gets thrown in front of Croc, the king now can't advance his army without his other military leader, it's all going Croc's way which makes us despair for anything good to happen in favour of the group. But before I get into what might be my favourite sequence in the entire story, I think it's important to point out something I didn't like. And while this is really the only thing I didn't like in the entire story, I thought it worth mentioning in the interest of transparency. Around this point we're greeted by another flashback demonstrating some of Koza's past, and also an audience he had with the king himself. Instead of having a normal conversation like humans about specific things and giving specific answers, the two decide to play the let's speak in vague ambiguous ways game so that one of us will leave the conversation with the wrong impression of the other. Koza asks the king question after question spiraling further into misunderstanding as the king gives vague responses. If he had gone into any detail to explain his situation, his circumstances and his own worries, there would have been no confusion. But he doesn't and as we are aware becomes the leader of the rebel forces. This is the only thing in the arc I didn't like and it sort of created artificial tension which is a shame considering the entire arc does a fantastic job of creating real tension everywhere else. But back to the Bond villain crocodile scenario and possibly my favourite scene in the entire series so far. His plan is fully explained as all great supervillain plans are but this time with a twist and this is what makes Croc a wonderfully fun and playful villain. He sees two things that Vivi loves and forces her to choose between them. Giving her the chance to make the impossible journey home across the desert and water to try to stop the rebellion or to save her friends as they are trapped in a cage with the water level in the room rising and the only key is apparently inside the stomach of one of the several crocodiles in his possession. Sort of a Sophie's Choice situation but that's not even the good part. You see just as Croc and Miss All Sunday are about to leave, Restaurant Le Crap calls the snail phone and this is when we realize that Sanji and Chopper are both still free and they have thought of a plan to help their situation. Croc recognizes the voice as the same one that was at Little Garden and to put the cherry on top of this cake, Sanji refers to himself in the call protecting his true identity going under the alias of Mr. Mr. Prince, Prince because he fully intends on rescuing the princess. I laughed out loud reading that and it was made all the more satisfying by just how awful and not at all according to plan the day has gone so far. So it's incredibly cathartic on one hand to see Croc's ego get tested and he now has some of his own medicine thrown into his face. And what's more is, as Chopper distracts Croc outside, something even more ridiculously awesome happens. Alright, so we find out that this key that they had been trying to get out of the Croc isn't even the real key, but let me tell you, I did expect them to get out, but I never would have guessed in a million years what happens next. So Sanji begins beating up the banana crocs until one of them spits out this ball. It's Mr. Friggin 3. He put himself into this little wax ball to protect himself when the crocs came to eat him after Crocodile threw him to them in the first place and he makes a wax key to get them out. How crazy is that? And what's even more awesome now is that Luffy finally has this opportunity to clob our croc. But let me tell you, this didn't go at all like I was expecting it to. I mentioned in my last video that I really didn't like King Wapple and on top of him largely being uninteresting to me, he also didn't offer Luffy any challenge whatsoever. And throughout the entire series so far, Luffy has has only really been taken to his limit by one person, Don Krieg. But this battle he has with Croc, and I use the word battle loosely, when I first read through it, really set an entirely different tone in this story for me, the likes of which I hadn't experienced so far in One Piece. The Crocodile character is one of the first of the seven warlords Luffy has ever faced, and the difference in League becomes immediately apparent as he uses his sand powers to evade every single one of Luffy's attacks. He's able to summon sandstorms, quicksand, and even demonstrates that he can suck the life out of living beings by dehydrating their bodies. He proves to us that there is an entirely new level of foe out there and the panels that come from this battle are honestly horrific. The most graphic being Luffy's impalement on the hook of Croc. All the enthusiasm, confidence and strength in the world couldn't save him. He didn't even really stand a chance. And with the gang now heading towards the kingdom thinking that Luffy has Croc handled, the little pirate's limp corpse is thrown into some quicksand before Croc makes his way to the palace himself. Now that's how you create suspense. What an outrageously compelling sequence. I think it should go without saying that I was completely blown away at this point. Now you're in the Air Force.
the payoff. I called this section the payoff not because this represents the climax necessarily, but because this is the section where every single bit of time Oda's invested into the character development of the Straw Hat crew pays off and then some. And much like the rest of the series, this is spectacularly paced and orchestrated. At no point did I feel like something was boring or lacking. Everything was pitch perfect as the Straw Hat crew made their way to the capital in their attempt to stop the agents of the Baroque Works, the rebellion, and ultimately prevent the country's collapse. Made all the more tense as, once again, utilizing dramatic irony, we know that Luffy has failed hard while the rest of the cast are none the wiser. But if I'm being completely honest here, the feeling of camaraderie and togetherness this are and really the rest of this series has fostered creates this incredibly unique atmosphere and as the gang triumphantly rides into the city with their plan in mind it feels both epic and fun especially when this marks the first time the forces of good have outsmarted the forces of the baroque works in this arc on their first attempt with oda placing each individual member of the straw hat crew like chess pieces to manifest the single most interesting fight sequences he possibly could you see at the time that they arrive at the capital it's been made known to us that the forces of the baroque work have as i alluded to earlier been given specific roles to carry out, and on top of that, lesser members have also infiltrated the army of the king and the rebels. Essentially, they've got their fingers on tons of pie, but that's okay, it seems, as the Straw Hat crew split up, as they now got a plan to deal with each individual agent or group of agents in some cases, which offers up just a bunch of really fun matchups and scenarios, not to mention fight scenes. And there are four of these fights in total. There's Usopp and Chopper versus Mr. Four and Miss Christmas, there's Sanji versus Mr. Two, Nami versus Miss Doublefinger, and finally, there's Zoro vs. Mr. One. Each fight sequence is given its own space and room to breathe, and what's more is that they also ascertain a particular pecking order within the group themselves in terms of who among them is the most capable and weakest based on their foes. And on top of that, they each offer a different tone to the story to avoid things becoming too stale. And while this section is mainly concerned with the fight scenes, conflicts might be a better word to use as this is a team effort and Vivi is very much involved in this struggle too, albeit not directly in battle but instead the opposite, trying to prevent the battle itself from happening between the kingdom and its people. And despite being put into the perfect circumstance to prevent this battle from even happening, Croc arrives and, you guessed it, ruins it. So before I get into these battles that I mentioned earlier, I want to make mention of two things. Obviously, Mr. Two is floating around with the ability now to transform into any one of her friends, and he does so by trying to apprehend Vivi pretending to be Usopp, armed even with some of the cloth around his left arm. However, after he calls Karu Bird, Vivi's suspicions are piqued, and when asked to prove his identity, he shows the cloth on his arm. But what we didn't know as an audience was that there was a part two to that plan of theirs from the beginning. They marked themselves with an X under the cloth to show people to prove who they are. Which honestly is a really smart thing, I think. And naturally, because he didn't show this X, she runs. And this is when the battles take place, both with the rebellion and with the fight scenes in the series so far. And I feel like a broken record repeating this, but this story keeps getting better. These aren't just whatever bland filler fights. These service the characters and obviously the story too. But what I love most about this section is how it's structured. It doesn't at all feel like we're waiting for Luffy to show up or like this is sort of stalling on behalf of Oda. And that's because the goal has always been to stop the fighting and rebellion in Alabasta. And so that's precisely what the others are doing in their individual fights right now. Sure, Luffy fighting Croc will play a role later, I'm sure, but all of these individual battles have massive importance and implications within the story. If these fights don't end in the favor of the Straw Hats, it's over. And what's more is we're made to feel that with the time this section is given to breathe. In Dragon Ball, you'd be hard pressed to find a long stretch of chapters that don't at least show Goku once. Heck, even when Goku's out of commission, Toriyama would often switch back to him healing in a tank or something. But in this story, Luffy is treated as if he's no longer a factor, like he's being taken care of. And that's because what's happening now is more important than him. This shows a tremendous confidence in the story and writing, and it's one of the reasons why this series works so friggin' well for me. It's not a one-note, one-character-led show. They're a team. They're a family. And having gone on this journey with them for all of these chapters, I can't help but feel part of that too. It's a great sensation and unlike anything I've ever experienced reading a manga. Usopp and Chopper vs Mr. Four and Miss Christmas I thought the idea of combining the forces of the two most uncertain characters in the crew was a fantastic one that really helped to establish the tension and struggle of the occasion within this fight scene right away. With both characters looking to the other to help come up with a plan or to run for help, it not only made for some hilarious moments implementing some of Usopp's trademark running away tactics and deceit, but also demonstrated for both characters their resolve and courage when faced with what turned out to be massively powerful foes. Ending on what I thought was a brilliantly heartfelt note as Usopp goes through hell 
Ellen back to provide Chopper the opening to deliver the final blow. And I also really sort of like the mechanisms that Chopper introduces to fight scenes. He eats this rumble ball and it gives Oda an excuse to do something clever when he uses it to enhance brain function for Chopper. And the ideas he comes up with in this fight really did take me by surprise. Of all the fights that take place before the main one, this one might actually be my favorite. Not to suggest that the others aren't great also, I think one aspect that this fight had over the others that makes it an unfair comparison is that it had a team dynamic that we don't often see as well as one of the biggest underdogs in the crew which is always fun to watch. Sanji vs Mr. Two. The role Sanji plays in this series is honestly phenomenal. Of all the characters in the Straw Hat crew, both he and Zoro in terms of demeanor are the most similar, I think. They are both extremely competent, loyal and cocky, but the aspects that make Sanji distinct are always highlighted by Oda, which only serves to make me enjoy him more. For example, after Princess Vivi discovers that the fake Usopp is actually Mr. Two in disguise, Sanji, as if his princess senses were tingling, swoops in to save the day. And it's moments like that with his very tongue-in-cheek Mr. Prince character that made this arc feel all the more fun for me. And if I'm being honest, I don't really like characters like Roshi from Dragon Ball or Brock from Pokemon because they always seem very one note and boring, not to mention predictable. But with the Sanji character, Oda combines his competence and his appreciation for the girls of this world to create a Prince Charming wannabe take on him that is both funny and appropriate for the setting. And what's more is that Sanji's fight with Mr. Two provides him the most interesting challenge as Mr. Two can become women in his life like Nami, requiring him to face his greatest weakness and to find means around that which he eventually does. Overall, I really enjoyed this fight scene, full of character and lighthearted humor. Nami versus Miss Doublefinger. And on the topic of humor, it's time for the Nami fight scene. One thing I wanted more than anything for Nami's character was for her to become more involved with the battles. Her character has always been more inclined to think first, steal second, and then fight if need be. But with the situations in the Grand Line becoming more and more intense, I'm glad Oda saw fit to have Usopp develop for her her very own special weapon. But what I didn't expect was how funny and disastrous it would be for her. Naturally, it's her first time using this new weapon, and the instructions manual that Usopp wrote up for her had an over emphasis on party tricks needless to say, but watching Nami try and figure out how this staff worked in order to best Miss Doublefinger was a treat and a half. And given that she's a navigator, for her weapon to utilize aspects navigators have to keep in mind like weather conditions was a really nice touch. And while this might not be the most epic of fights, it certainly provided a leg up for Nami as a character to stay up there with the rest of them, and it was damn funny which really helped with the story's pacing. Zoro vs Mr. One Zoro's fight against Mr. One is another great matchup not only because he has a body made entirely of steel blades and thus makes a great match for Zoro, but it's also interesting, as my editor had to point out to me, that in Mr. One's very first debut scene, in the manga, the automatopoeia that accompanies that panel is a sound associated with metal and blades. So if I was looking out for that, I could have, in a sense, discovered the nature of his power before even really being shown it, which is a really unusual but very cool detail to add to your story. With that said, however, the main meat and potatoes of this sequence is basically Zoro can't cut through steel, so he takes it as a great opportunity to grow as a swordsman. There's some really cool shots in this exchange too with Zoro lifting a building, but also flashbacks into his past that lead him to reach this state of power, where he can effectively hear everything or something like that. Ultimately, the fight ends in his favor, having been able to on this occasion cut through steel, but not having mastered this new state he's discovered. And to reiterate, as I said before, all of these fights served the story massively, and not only held my attention thoroughly, but they also entertained me, furthering the story of each of these characters' independent narratives in new and interesting ways, reinforcing for me my appreciation and love for this ragtag group of misfits. And to think, we haven't even gotten to the good part yet. The climax. When it comes to stories like this one, after having landed so many convincing subversions, swerves, and surprises that have left me overjoyed while reading, the ending is the moment where the story makes or breaks itself for many of us. A lot of people, when they now think of Game of Thrones, the first thing that pops into their head is the rushed ending and not the years of quality writing that preceded it. But when it comes to this arc, not only does it stick the landing, it sets the standard. Immediately after the Straw Hat crew achieve their goal of taking out their respective targets, in a scene that is as compelling as it is tense, Croc reveals in front of Princess Vivi and the King that he is specifically after something called a Poneglyph, which only Miss All Sunday is able to read and will use it to point him in the direction of something called a Pluton, a massively powerful tool of destruction he has been after since the very start that would grant him the power to destroy entire islands in an instant. Needless to say, that's not good, but what's more is that in 30 minutes it's revealed a massive cannon ball will hit destroying a three mile radius starting at the city, which achieves two things narratively. 
Firstly, it paints Croc as an even more insane psychopath, lying even to his Baroque work subordinates, throwing them into the situation wherein they won't survive, revealing to us that he trusts no one. But it also provides the Straw Hats with a new goal. Find the bomb or person setting off the bomb and stop it or them at the source. The goal of the crew and the forces of good are in a constant cycle of completion and renewal, and without a goal, we the audience get kind of bored, so this is a fantastic way to naturally extend the tension in the series. This helps keep the pace feeling fresh, and now that a time limit has been put onto it, it becomes all the more suspenseful as we, or at least I, had no idea how this was going to be resolved. And there are little things here and there that fill my mind with wonder and appreciation for this story. Like, there's this moment where Vivi convinces the forces of the palace and the rebels to stop fighting in an effort to evacuate the city in time to make a significant difference. But Croc says in passing so, so many chapters ago that he sends some of his lesser forces to infiltrate the ranks of both the palace guard and the rebel forces. And in calling back to that, the undercover Baroque Works members within the battle continue the fighting by shooting Koza, inciting a massive riot and once again the battle continues. It's spectacular and I never saw it coming. So what are they going to do now? There's such a palpable buildup of anticipation, suspense, despair and tension. With the rebellion going to hell, Zoro gravely injured now after his battle with Mr. One, a bomb about to go off in like 15 minutes, and now Croc apprehends Princess Vivi dangling her over a massive drop. He lets her go. It's such an incredible buildup of tragedy. And now we as an audience have now reached the lowest point we can go in the story. And so it's time to explode once again with optimism soaring through the air on the back of a once thought to be dead Royal Guard Pell. Luffy makes the save for Princess Vivi. This is where the payoff for all the time spent without Luffy comes flying in to inject some much needed light to this dark situation. But that's not to say the tension is gone either. We know how Luffy handled or <clears throat> didn't handle Croc the last time and there's still only 50 minutes left for him to win the day against what is still one of the seven warlords of the sea. And as Luffy catches Vivi, she starts to break down. Similar to how Nami did so during the Arlong Park arc, Vivi has been trying everything in her power to make the difference to save her country, her kingdom, her people. Vivi grabs Luffy tightly, her face slowly crumbling before him. She weeps over the fact that no one can hear her, that everyone will die, that everything will be lost and that there's nothing they can do. Luffy simply responds, don't worry, I can hear your voice. What a fantastic line. And with that, Luffy launches himself head first to Croc. Zero hesitation. And thanks to the Yuba water he brought on his back, he's able to cover himself head to toe in it, which allows him to make contact with Croc. He took the one yeah. piece of information gleaned from his first fight and formed an entire strategy around it. And that's not even my favorite part. The symbolism here is sensational. Yuba's water allowed Luffy to touch Croc. Croc even mentioned during the fight that Luffy didn't stand a chance in this dry climate. But what's even better is that the water being used symbolizes the trust of the king and the love he had for his people and the love they had for him. The water from Yuba wouldn't have been there had the old man not believed in his country and his king. And now that loyalty and love, that power of Alabasta, is going to provide Luffy the means with which to take out its biggest foe. Crocodile. I am utterly speechless with how well this all ties together thematically. And in addition to that, it also provides reason as to why Croc wanted specifically to steal the rain from the country in the first place. To make himself more powerful and to remove his weakness entirely. It wasn't just to frame the king. My god, this is amazing! <laughs> On top of that, not only are Croc's powers of sand and dehydration great for a villain, but his motivations and decisions also help cement him as, for me, the absolute best villain this series has shown us thus far. No contest, not even close, don't at me. And the fight that ensues has some awesome back and forths in the form of Luffy finally getting some great hits on him, Luffy drinking all the water, and even a particularly graphic scene that shows Luffy completely dehydrated which he manages to find a way out of using very clever tactics. And it's during this part of the arc things get more and more serious as the Straw Hats barely manage to find the bomb in time, in a way that is both lighthearted but also utilizes everyone on the team, leaving Vivi to be the one to prevent it, which I really liked considering it's her story at the end of the day. However, and unfortunately for the Straw Hat crew, it's revealed that the bomb itself is on a timer anyway, as a contingency plan set by Crocodile. But at the last second, in what was once again a moment I absolutely didn't see coming, Pell swoops down and sacrifices himself for the kingdom. And once again, the way it's panelled, the way it's timed, the way it's carried out by Oda, 
I cried. That's twice I've cried in this arc so far. And with that out of the way, Luffy just barely manages to take out Croc in what ended up being an incredibly scrappy fight, with Luffy even resorting to use his own blood to hit Crocodile. And if that wasn't enough, the final problem still remained. They had to stop the rebellion. And what does Oda do? With Crocodile's defeat, it begins to rain once again over the kingdom because he was the one preventing it. Bringing an end to that long drought, echoing the old man's words, once it rains, the fighting will end. What a perfect finish to the action. That ties the choreography, the motivations, the conflict and themes into a big finish. This arc has left me utterly speechless on so many occasions and it still has one left to get me with. And those of you that have seen this arc, you know what I'm going to be talking about and that's Vivi's goodbye at the end. And this was much more touching than I thought it was going to be. Having spent the entire saga with this character through Reverse Mountain, Whiskey Peak, Little Garden, Drum Island, and now this, the Alabasta arc, she's become a staple of the crew, but I think Oda made the right decision ultimately by not making her a full-time one and keeping her where she wanted to be at her kingdom. Reason being, the one aspect of the Straw Hat crew that ties them all together is that they all share a dream that can be fulfilled by traveling and exploring the world as pirates. Luffy wants to be the Pirate King. Zoro wants to become the greatest swordsman in the land. Nami wants to map the world. Sanji wants to find the All Blue. Usopp wants to become a great warrior of the sea. And Chopper wants to learn enough about medicine to cure anything. But Princess Vivi wanted to save her kingdom, and now she has. And while I will miss her, I think the decision she ultimately makes is a good one. And if she had stayed, we wouldn't have gotten one of the best send-offs I've ever seen in any character get in a series of any kind. With the X on their arm reminding Luffy of a small but really nice moment between the two in the early days of the saga. It definitely brought a tear to my eye once again and left me with a whirlwind of emotions to end what was, without an ounce of hyperbole, the single greatest manga reading experience of my life. Thank you Oda for writing this true epic of a story. And what makes this even better is that dotted throughout this story there have been little hints of more to come and to expect in the story. Specifically with the character of Miss All Sunday who we learn is called Nico Robin. I didn't mention this in the review but she saved Luffy after that first fight with Croc. She betrayed him and now at the very end wants to be one of the Straw Hats? So I have literally no idea what to make of this. But the chaotic energy with which this story is progressing and how vulnerable my emotions feel with the slight danger that befalls each of these characters I've become now incredibly attached to is a sign that I will be in for a very rough ride, I'm sure. With this arc now done, I suppose the goal now is to continue down the chain of islands until we reach the end, taking care of every subsequent warlord of the sea. I wonder if Whitebeard is a warlord. One thing that really bothers me is that dude that controls the weather with the tattoo in his face. I don't have the first idea where he fits into all of this and don't even get me started on the misunderstanding Ace had on Drum Island looking for Luffy or Blackbeard. I don't want to say I think time travel is involved but it feels like it might be or that people broadly speaking are using dated info if they think that Blackbeard is gone. And in addition to that I'm really excited to see how Robin plays a role into all of this. She definitely doesn't feel like a good guy character right now but is definitely distinct enough from the rest of them to make a very interesting crew member if nothing else. But with that all finally done this is where the Alabasta arc ends and where my review ends. Tune in next week when I'll be reviewing Jaya and the Skypia arcs in full. I honestly can't wait to see what's to come, but as always, I've been Totally Not Mark, I'll see you all next week, and thank you so much for watching.